we're going to talk about heat in chemical reactions. So we started by talking about heat changes when things melt, things boil, we're adding heat in, things are changing in temperature, but we can't avoid the fact that during chemical reactions, heat is released. So, you know, think about things like fire or those icy packs where you break them up and they get cold. There are definitely heat involved in chemical reactions. And I've got, of course, a TED Ed video to show you because I love them and it does a nice job of explaining heat. You know how sometimes you go to bake a cake, but your bananas have all gone rotten, your utensils have rusted, you trip and pour all of your baking soda into the vinegar jug and then your oven explodes? My friend, you and your chemical reactions have fallen victim to enthalpy and entropy, and boy are they forces to be reckoned with. Now your reactants are all products. So what are these E words, and what's their big idea? Let's start with enthalpy, an increase or decrease of energy during a chemical reaction. Every molecule has a certain amount of chemical potential energy stored within the bonds between its atoms. Chemicals with more energy are less stable, and thus more likely to react. Let's visualize the energy flow in a reaction, the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen, by playing a round of crazy golf. Our goal is to get a ball, the reactant, up a small rise, and down the other, much steeper, slope. Where the hill goes up, we need to add energy to the ball. And where it goes down, the ball releases energy into its surroundings. The whole represents the product, or result of the reaction. When the reaction period ends, the ball is inside the hole, and we have our product, water. This, like when our oven exploded, is an exothermic reaction, meaning that the chemical's final energy is less than its starting energy, and the difference has been added to the surrounding environment as light and heat. We can also play out the opposite type of reaction, an endothermic reaction, where the final energy is greater than the starting energy. That's what we were trying to achieve by baking our cake. The added heat from the oven would change the chemical structure of the proteins in the eggs and various compounds in the butter. So that's enthalpy. As you might suspect, exothermic reactions are more likely to happen than endothermic ones because they require less energy to occur. But there's another independent factor that can make reactions happen, entropy. Entropy measures a chemical's randomness. Here's an enormous pyramid of golf balls. Its ordered structure means it has low entropy. However, when it collapses, we have chaos everywhere, balls bouncing high and wide, so much so that some even go over the hill. This shift to instability, or higher entropy, can allow reactions to happen. As with the golf balls, in actual chemicals, this transition from structure to disorder gets some reactants past the hump and lets them start a reaction. You can see both enthalpy and entropy at play when you go to light a campfire to cook dinner. Your match adds enough energy to activate the exothermic reaction of combustion, converting the high-energy combustible material in the wood to lower-energy carbon dioxide and water. Entropy also increases and helps the reaction along because the neat, organized log of wood is now converted into randomly moving water vapor and carbon dioxide. The energy shed by this exothermic reaction powers the endothermic reaction of cooking your dinner. Bon appétit! Okay, so a lot of E words right? We've got energy, enthalpy, entropy. Um, sometimes it helps to go back through that video if you want to remember more about it, because those words can get kind of messed up in your head. All right. Way back at the beginning of the year of chemistry, right? We talked about atoms and atoms bond together to form compounds. Well, compounds are formed from these elements and they have heat energy stored in their bonds. And that heat energy within their bonds is called enthalpy. And enthalpy is known as H. That is the symbol we use. We don't use an E. Um, and then a chemical reaction is when we take 
the reactants here, and I'm sorry, it looks like this is in the wrong spot. We have reactants that will transfer into products. So if you have Na and Cl, it makes, of course, NaCl. And because that um, chlorine is diatomic, you have to have um, the twos to make sure that it's balanced. So in a chemical reaction, heat is absorbed and we call it endothermic or heat is released and we call it exothermic. It's exactly like you would think about endothermic things feel cold, exothermic things feel hot. So fires, exothermic, cold packs, endothermic. Um, this reaction right here, Na and Cl is very exothermic. In fact, when sodium and chlorine get together, they catch on fire. All right, so in an endothermic reaction, it's like going uphill, okay? It absorbs heat. The products are at a higher energy than the reactants. So the delta H is positive. That's the reactant reaction pathway there. There is a net, we call it absorption of energy. It absorbs energy. For example, the breakdown of water by electrolysis, that's where we take electricity and we pump it in to water and it breaks apart into hydrogen and oxygen that absorbs energy when that happens. Okay, in an exothermic reaction, this releases heat, all right? The products are at a lower energy than the reactants. This would be like campfires, um, any other explosions, dynamites. We call this one, like you said, like going downhill. There's more energy at the start, less energy at the end. Now the formation of water is famously exothermic because when you take hydrogen and oxygen and you form it together, it releases a ton of heat. And guys, this is hydrogen powered vehicles. This is how they're powered. They're powered with the exothermic re reaction that makes water out of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, often we don't see them as hills like that. Instead, they are um, energy curves, right? Because it usually doesn't just fly downhill. If it did, that wouldn't be very handy, okay? Especially think gasoline. We don't want our gasoline just exploding out of nowhere. Instead, we need to get over this hump we call the activation energy, all right? And this energy curve, you can see here, the products, or I'm sorry, the reactants have more energy than the products, but there's a curve, there's a hump to get over there. And like I said, this hump is called activation energy. It's the energy the reactants need to change into products, okay? Lighting a match. We know that the match in the box is chemically reactive. We know that it has something that makes a chemical reaction happen in it where it lights and it lets off energy, but it doesn't light until we strike it. So striking that match is the activation energy needed to get the match burn, burned. And like I said, we show this mathematically or graphically by showing a little hump that it has to get over. The size of that hump is by definition, the activation energy, okay? So little short humps have small activation energy, big humps have bigger activation energy. Um, like I said, burning gasoline, good example. We don't want it just flying downhill. We wanna make sure that there is activation energy needed. Now you can add something called a catalyst. You may have learned this in a biology class. That means that as you're going over that hump, a catalyst lowers the activation energy. It lowers the energy needed to start the chemical reaction. It's like a shortcut, okay? Provides a different energy pathway and it um, makes it a little bit shorter. It's like a little shortcut there. All right, now the other thing he talked about in the video is a very weird thing, all right? but it, it definitely matters when we're talking about overall energy in a system. And this is called entropy. And entropy is very weird because entropy is messiness, right? 
It is the energy of the disorder of the matter in the system. So the best thing to think about is, is water again, right? Water is so simple. So ice is a solid. It's all nice and lined up. It's like a crystalline structure. It has very low entropy because it has low disorder. Whereas, you know, liquid water has more disorder. And of course, steam has the most disorder. All right. It is in a form of energy. It does have a unit. It's in joules per Kelvin because it actually is determined by temperature, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, nature wants to be messier, right? So I always use the joke, if you have a really messy room, um, you can tell your parents that you're just moving towards more entropy. You are becoming more stable as nature intended you to be, all right? Like I said before, solids have the least amount of entropy and gases have the most amount of entropy. So that's a really easy thing to think about when you're talking about entropy in the reaction. Um, a gas produced from a liquid or solid has more entropy. Uh, the other thing, which it's hard to read down here, you can't read it, but this one says that the more particles there are, the more entropy. So if you go, again, let's use the formation of water as our example. If you go from H, two plus O2 and it yields H2O um, and you do need two of these and then you need two of these. Um, you're actually decreasing the entropy in this reaction because what you're doing is you're making less particles. You had more particles to start with on the left and you're making less particles on the right. And this should make sense to you because the less stuff you have in your room, the less likely it is to be messy. So that's entropy and it's, it's kind of weird. So reactions are what we call favorable or not favorable. It is more favorable for a reaction to have a negative delta H, right? In, if we go downhill, right? And we release energy. What it does is it increases stability. Nature wants to run downhill. Nature is lazy. It is more positive for you to have a positive delta S that's entropy. More entropy or more disorder means more stability. Um, so nature is lazy. It runs downhill and nature is messy. All right, that, that's what it favors. It favors laziness and it favors messiness. The unfavored condition would be rolling uphill and becoming more neat. So if both conditions happen, if you are lazy and messy, the reaction will always be what we call spontaneous. And spontaneous reactions mean once we get them started, they go, all right? So think about dynamite for a minute. Dynamite is nice and neat and orderly. And within even its chemical structure, it's nice and neat and orderly. It has big molecules. And then after dynamite explodes, it becomes all these gases and it explodes into lots of different things. Dynamite is a great example of a spontaneous reaction. If both of them don't happen, the reaction is not going to be spontaneous if you're trying to run in the other direction. And the example of that would be the, uh, you know, the idea that you're going to run something backwards from what it should go. Um, that's a little bit harder. Now you might be wondering, well, what happens if one of these is negative and then the other one is also negative? What if you have something that's exothermic, but it's going to become more orderly? This is the example of our electric car. Um, it is an exothermic reaction. It releases heat when you make water but it becomes less messy. And in this case, we have to take one more form of energy into account and that's called Gibbs free energy. We're not gonna study it much this year because it's a really complicated concept. If you're gonna take AP bio, you will have to understand Gibbs free energy. So now is a good time to kind of look into it. Gibbs free energy says, okay, fine. If it's exothermic, 
and it's less orderly, it's gonna be spontaneous at lower temperatures. So actually temperature comes into account. If it's endothermic, like ice melting, but it creates more disorder, it's spontaneous at higher temperatures, just like ice melting. And that is it. That's it for, for pretty much everything having to do with um, thermodynamics. Do you guys